Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute, and the sponsor for this episode is the Georgian Papers Program. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 177 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Did you know that maps have social lives? I admit, it's kind of weird to think about an inanimate object as having a social life. And yet, maps do and did have social lives. Maps actually facilitate a lot of different social and political relationships between people and nations. And they did a lot of this work for Americans throughout the early American past. Martin Bruckner, a professor of English at the University of Delaware, joins us to discuss early American maps and early American map making with details from his book, The Social Life of Maps in America. And as we explore maps and map making in early America, Martin reveals how maps have social lives, the development of early Americans' interest in maps and the types of maps they were interested in, and details about how early Americans drew, printed, and manufactured their own maps between 1750 and 1860. But first, as you might have guessed, we're going to talk about several different maps in this episode. And thanks to the generosity of the Omohundro Institute and the University of North Carolina Press, you will find three of the most talked about maps as well as two chapters from Martin's book in the free OI Reader app. To access these maps and these chapters, all you need to do is download the OI Reader app to your favorite iOS or Android device. To do this, just visit your favorite app store and search for OI Reader, or visit benfranklinsworld.com slash OI Reader. Okay, are you ready to explore the early American world of maps and map making? Let's go meet our expert guide. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Joining us is a professor of English and the director of the Center for Material Culture Studies at the University of Delaware. His research interests include early American literature and culture and early American cartography. And he's the author of two books, The Geographic Revolution in Early America, Maps, Literacy, and National Identity, and, most recently, The Social Life of Maps in America, 1750 to 1860. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Martin Bruckner. Hi, thank you for having me. Martin, I have to say, you have a really interesting book title, The Social Life of Maps in America. It implies that maps have social lives, and I wonder, how exactly can a map have a social life? I've been asked this question many times. The function for me to think about maps as having a social life is because both a map as an artifact and the concept of mapping basically are in a constant process of social exchange. I mean, just think for a second, when a map is being made, all the kind of social exchanges that go into the process of making the map, the exchange of data and ideas, the choice of designs, the choice of technology, the patterns of mechanical reproduction, and the people involved in that. And at the same time, and that's something people also forget then, is that the very thing of the map, not the image, not the actual outline of the map, but the thing, the object of the map, then begins to shape people's social actions. Maps are conversation pieces, they're display objects, they're sentimental possessions, they even serve as material proof of a concept, whether it's ownership of property, or even in our case, in the United States case, the fact that there's a thing called a nation. And so we tend to focus, and this is kind of, again, a long way of answering what is the social life of a map, we tend to focus on the accuracy of maps usually, or in the way in which they manipulate us to thinking about space, the way they represent power, But we don't realize that maps have a material biography. And the moment you think about the map as having its own point of origin, that it has its own kind of life cycles, its career, its kind of afterlife, once it is published, once it is being used, the types of uses that were maybe intended and then uses that were coming about unintentionally, all that kind of rolled together, that's what makes the social life of a map. You really make it sound like maps have functions beyond telling us about location. And they do, absolutely. They are representational devices on multiple levels. Of course, we think of it first and foremost, and that's how we've been trained for decades by now, to think that this is a representation of space in a very unique form. It's two-dimensional, it's abstract, it's using geometry as its base, as its graphic base. But as another way of thinking about it, 
it's a representation of how people interacted with space. And so by that point, you start thinking about the maps as having these alternate functions that can be really display objects that are decorative. They can be display objects that are helping a family track loved ones, whether it's during the Revolutionary War, later on in the Civil War. So the function of the map or the role of the map is not just pure information or purely about geographical knowledge, but it's also really about experiences of maps, how people experience a map in their own personal lives rather than us thinking of it as being like an image or a window into history. Now, we're going to talk about how early Americans experienced maps, as well as how map makers made maps in early America. But before we dive deep into our exploration of those aspects of maps, we really should explore how Martin studies maps. Martin, how do you study maps? I mean, you're a scholar of literature and culture, and you read maps as historical sources. So how do you read maps, and do you read them in a way that may be different from how, say, historians who read historical letters and texts might read them? Great question. This is like an existential question almost for my work. I should also qualify saying that I am a trained map maker and a land surveyor, and I studied as a geographer before I turned to literature. But the training that we receive in literary studies and in material culture studies, for that matter, I think positions me or makes me ask questions differently about the subject of my study. And in the case of maps, for example, it's a way of how we position yourself. So one way to ask is what can a map tell me? What can it do for me? And I think this is usually the dominant way of how people are thinking of maps. Is it evidence? Is it proof of something? Does it help me define a boundary? But for me, the interesting thing, and that's something I took away from literary studies, is to switch this and basically ask, what does the map want? What is the purpose of the map from within rather than the one that I project onto it? And the moment I switch that perspective, I actually am beginning to think about the way in which maps were used, its form and function, how they were experienced. And with that, I think this is perhaps the different types of question being framed by non-historians as such is that we're asking for the way in which an object is being treated in its own time as an experience rather than as just the empirical fact. I might be generalizing here. Also, in the context of my particular book project, the first third is history straight up. It is really reconstructing the making of a map, the production patterns, the sheer numbers of quantities and uh, materials that go into the making of a map, the number of people involved. So in that level, I think, like many of my colleagues in literary studies too, we are profoundly historicist in our approach. But then the next step would be to say, what is our perspective vis-a-vis the outcome? How do we want to interpret this particular phenomenon or object? I think that's how I would position myself to what do I bring to the table as a scholar of literature and material culture. Okay, with that background in place, let's begin our exploration of early American maps with wall maps. Martin, would you describe wall maps for us? Who owned and viewed wall maps in early America, and just how big of a wall did you need to have in order to display a wall map during the 18th century? Fundamentally, you would argue all maps circulating in early America had the capacity to become wall maps. Just think of the way in which you might have pinned up your own National Geographic map, and early Americans were no different. The moment they had their hands on a map, it really very quickly migrated out of books if they were cutout maps, and then they ended up on people's walls. Small maps, in particular book maps, magazine maps, were used by early Americans very early on. We have reports of the Mather family swapping hand-drawn maps by Cotton Mather of all people. Then we would later on discover that Betsy Ross of fame in Philadelphia would have a smallish magazine map pinned up in her home. All this you discover in probate records and in wills and in inventories. So this is kind of the generic answer. You could say any map is a wall map, but at the same time, map makers specialized very early on, I would say since the early 17th century, devising or designing maps explicitly for just becoming wall hangings. And those maps were multi-sheet maps. They used to be two to four to six to eight to even 20 sheets large. They would have special borders that could only be fused together once you actually assemble the whole map. They would have been pasted on cotton and muslin. They would have been equipped with wooden rollers and dowels and hanging mechanisms. And those maps then migrated also into the homes of people in the colonies. I mean, by the 1720s, 1730s, I see the first evidence that people were deliberately hanging up these large maps designed as wall maps in their homes. Most famously, then perhaps the Jefferson Fry map of Virginia, 
Thomas Jeffrey's map of New England, those were the first maps that really kind of captured people's imagination as wall maps. You mentioned that some of the earliest maps came over in the 1720s and 1730s, but when did early Americans really develop their interest in maps and why were they so interested in them? The quick answer would be to say the moment you migrate to an unknown place, you wanted to have a visual before you arrive and kind of begin to plot out how would you set up your own new home. But at the same time, once the colonists had arrived in the colonies, they were using maps very quickly as a way of organizing their society. So on the one hand, you had the crown, especially after 1690, after the crown revoked all land charters and people had to resurvey their property. The Board of Trade came in demanding that provinces would be and counties would be resurveyed. So from that moment on forward, you would have had a slew of new maps being produced. But they were produced by imperial map makers. They would be printed and made in London, and then they migrated back to North America. American maps in the early phase were really rudimentary. The very earliest maps would have been in the New England Prospect by William Wood. It was a woodcut. I mean, when you see it today, you just shake your head because it's like a child's drawing almost. And this was just a question of, in this case, skill sets and access to technology so that people couldn't quite make maps the way in which the imperial centers like London or Paris could generate. If most of the maps in colonial British America were produced in London and then imported to North America, did this importation impact and inflate the price of maps? And if it did, who exactly could afford to still display a map in their home? Right. And not many at first. That was one of the biggest problems for maps to enter into circulation in large numbers. So I guess the star witness would have been the Henry Popple map, the uh, British Empire in America, which was the largest map produced by English printmakers in the 18th century. It was hung in the state house, in the old state house in Philadelphia. John Adams saw it and was actually so enthralled by it that he wrote to his wife, Abigail, this is the largest map I ever saw. This map would have been incredibly expensive. It cost over a pound. So this would have been possibly the income of a day laborer, like an annual income or half a year's income for some people. They would have been luxury goods. Just even the sheer get up of these maps, again, the the kind of physical makeup of these maps would have earmarked them or really demonstrated them to be consumer goods that are appealing to people of means. And all that changed pretty much in the 1750s when we had the moment of domestic map production, domestic as in American-made maps coming out in larger numbers. And by that point, suddenly the prices adjusted so that even middle income and lower income people could afford a largish map and hang that up in their houses. Would you tell us more about what the Popple map depicted and what its depiction was meant to showcase? Because when we spoke with Jennifer Van Horn in episode 136, she talked about giant cityscape paintings and how early Americans commissioned these very large views of cities, all to convey and showcase their message of, hey, We colonial Americans have made it. We're an actual society. England, Parliament, you really need to start taking us seriously. And I wonder, did the Popple map depict or display a similar message? Or could maps perform the same function as these large cityscape paintings? They would have done this function before the American Revolution if you were interested in thinking of the colonies as just your imperial possessions. And the Popple map would have been your prime example for this. It was sponsored by the Board of Trade. It was very quickly refuted by map users saying it's totally inaccurate. It's large, eight by eight feet, very beautifully painted usually, but it was considered to be a totally useless map when you wanted to navigate it. I mean, it included all kinds of factual mistakes. It imagined a super highway that would cut through the upper part of what now is Michigan. And it was really designed to demonstrate British possessions vis-a-vis the French so that this map would demonstrate to Englishmen imperial Englishmen, that here they have the dominance over the North American continent. For Americans that, I mean, coming back to this question, at what point do they become a way of demonstrating your own identity or say something about your own community? That happens after the American Revolution, when you have basically national maps emerging in large numbers and very diverse numbers too. And that happens very quickly in 1784, which I think of as as the takeoff year of U.S. American map making. And you have several national maps that really highlight the boundaries of the nation state, which for all intents and purposes basically was a risky argument because nobody quite knew yet if the nation would hang together and hold together. And suddenly you at least have a map that shows how all the different parts put together and once assembled actually make up this thing called the United States of America. 
As Martin related, by 1750, Americans started making their own maps in North America, and between 1750 and 1860, Philadelphia emerged as the center of North American map making. Martin, why did Americans start making their own maps, and why and how did Philadelphia become the center of early American map making? Thanks for kind of going back to the colonial decade. In that sense, the 1750s are really a turning point because by that moment, Americans realized that maps made by English surveyors or English printers would always privilege an imperial perspective and colonial interests would be basically relegated to a lesser important status. And 1755 is kind of the moment when we have three different maps showing up at the same time. This is John Mitchell's map that was actually then used for signing the Treaty of Paris in 1783. It is the Jefferson Fry map that shows Virginia, and it is Lewis Evans, and that's the important one, this kind of combination, who shows us the mid-Atlantic region, but made by an American surveyor, or he's an immigrant, but by somebody who actually traveled America extensively, did his own surveys, and then drew his own maps based on his own information. And I think that was crucial that Americans discovered we need to make our own cartographic archive and not be reliant and dependent on imports all the time. So when we look at someone like Lewis Evans, how exactly did he make his map? You said he went out and he took his own surveys and then he used that information to draw his own map. But what exactly went into the process of making a map in mid-18th century North America? It's a very convoluted and very difficult process for the earliest map makers since they didn't have the, let's say, the economic and material backing that London map maker or Paris map maker would have had. So Lewis Evans equipped with his own geodetic archive of surveying references, he would have still had to borrow other people's maps. He would have still had to rely on travel reports from other fellow North American travelers. He then painstakingly would have had to transfer all this information into a paper draft, which he then had to find a printer who could actually create a map. And he did our first, what I understand to be the first large American-made map. It was 22 by 30 inches. He had to find a printer who could actually first engrave the map and then print it. He had to find a roller press that allows him to even print such a large map. And I think the evidence now suggests that Ben Franklin actually lent his own printing press for this. There were only two of that size in Philadelphia at that point. So it was basically a labor of love. It was very underpaid. He had to constantly ask for subventions. So as an early American map maker like Lewis Evans, you're basically having to have hold down a day job before you can become the map maker of fame that you eventually would become. Yeah, it definitely sounds like there was a lot of work that went into making Evans's map. So I wonder, what was the market like for people interested in purchasing Evans's native North American map? I mean, how many people stood ready to purchase a copy? The market was very receptive. That is the surprising find of my study, that because of international frictions, I mean, we are talking the 1750s, so the French and Indian War or the Seventh Year War, depending on which side of the Atlantic you are, was just about to kick in. And people were looking for maps. They were looking for cartographic information. So he found a receptive audience, but he was very savvy as an entrepreneur. So he very quickly discovered that, A, his maps were not only selling well within the colonies, so he didn't even bother marketing them to Europeans specifically. That would have been the old approach that Jefferson Fry and all these guys all did. But he also then started transfer printing his map onto silk handkerchiefs, onto calico cloth, and he folded them into pamphlets. So he was very savvy and also quick to realize that people were already thinking of maps as doing things that are more than just showing me the mid-Atlantic or a particular space. They really thought of maps as being some kind of supplement or some kind of accessory, even if you think of handkerchiefs, that you'd be carrying with you in order to not necessarily navigate. And that's the whole point, right? That they are fulfilling a different social function. So it sounds like there was really an opportunity for Evans and possibly even other map makers in this early period to transform map making from a hobby or side hustle, as we call it today, into a vocation and thriving business. Yes. And the transition really occurred by the 1790s. That's when you have, you still have this artisan approach, the shopkeeper or the workshop approach to map making. You still have the majority of maps made by people who do have day jobs. Many of them are actually goldsmiths, silversmiths working in those fields because then they would be able to do the engraving themselves. But by 1795, you have Matthew Carey, a printer in Philadelphia, 
decide that maps are actually commodities that are saleable and possibly even best selling. And he sets out to produce one of the first American atlases. And in the process of doing so, he created a new business model. He still had to farm out the map production to individual map draftsmen and then engravers, but he was the central figure who oversaw the whole production from beginning, middle to end. And he was also then in charge of sending maps into transit, where you suddenly find Parson uh, Weems, for example, as one of his itinerant salesmen who would travel the South and the Southeast and take his maps all the way down to the Carolinas. And what was it about the 1790s that made it possible to go from an artisanal approach to map making to a mode of manufacture that allowed for a greater volume of maps to be produced? The 1790s, I think, were not quite yet ready. I mean, people were experimenting with thinking of map production as a high volume output. But it was certainly the moment when people are beginning to just create new maps in large numbers. And this has partly to do with the fact that we are looking at a new nation where each state has its own maps made. But in terms of production, the printing presses, the paper production, the types of paper available were very similar to what you would have found in the 1780s or in the 1800s. So in that sense, it was just purely the business model of Matthew Carey of being a publisher, a map publisher rather than the map maker that increased the volume or that it was responsible for increasing the volume of map production. By the time John Mellish comes around, again, the technology has not changed that much, but here is somebody who really from the get-go, the moment he launches drawing his own maps, purely a hobby cartographer, but he goes forth with a little bit of personal capital and creates a map publishing house that within three years, he starts in 1812. By 1815, he is the most dominant and the most prominent map maker in America to the point where magazines basically use him as like the benchmark or the gold standard of quality maps. So that would be, again, the realization that between 1719 and 1810, maps become identified as a brand object, not so much as the object that you use in order to navigate your world, or that this is perhaps a pretty picture that you want to hang on the wall, but that certain types of maps now are imbued with this explicit recognition of that this is a brand name. Do we know why there was a shift from thinking of maps as artisanal products, you know, something that was produced by a process where there would have been a surveyor, an engraver, and a printer all working together to produce a map, to a standalone form of publication? That's an interesting point. And here I really have to think a little bit because maps in and of themselves were intriguing to people and were, again, as I was mentioning earlier, They really kind of tapped people's emotions. They tapped people's sentimental feelings for a certain place. They tapped people's ambitions for that matter. There was a lot of literature about people actually lamenting that maps could raise a new generation of imperialists in the new republic. But I think one way to answer this would be to think of how suddenly through the massive proliferation of maps, People discover in maps a different visual aid, a different visual format, which they can imagine themselves as they inhabit spaces, but also as they can imagine the spatial relationships between urban areas and the countryside, between data sets, whether they are like demographic data or other kind of statistical data. And I think that is at the heart of this proliferation of maps. John Mellish, again, would be perhaps one of these key figures because the moment he discovered that just national maps alone will fill his pockets. I mean, it made him rich at first, but he very quickly also experimented with all kinds of thematic maps where he had uh, diagram maps that were measuring just the distances or showing just the distances between places. He had school maps or they had what we perceive perhaps even as mental maps today. And he also had literary maps so that he published a map that would accompany Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. So we basically are looking at a phenomenon, not so much a phenomenon. I think the phenomenon is the product of a confluence of developments where you have American citizens becoming increasingly exposed to maps. Maps become central to elementary education. Map literacy was basically valued as highly as alphabetic literacy by the 1800s. And then the realization that through this graphic medium, this media platform map, you can actually show so many more things other than just a topography or the outline of the nation state. American map making underwent another large change during the 1820s. And after we take a moment to talk about our sponsor, we'll ask Martin to tell us about this shift. History and archival work go hand in hand. Letters, journals, and diaries are just some of the key records historians use to better understand the past. In fact, 
Researchers will spend hours examining and transcribing all these different types of records, all to help them see particular moments of the past better. They may also spend lots of time and money traveling to archives to conduct their research, too. Although now, research is getting a bit easier and a bit cheaper to do as more and more archives are digitizing their records and putting them up online so that anyone with a computer can examine them. In fact, the Omohundro Institute, the producer of Ben Franklin's World, is a primary partner in one such project to put the entire archive of the Georgian monarchs online. Locked for over a century in the Round Tower at Windsor Castle, the papers of the King Georges, George I, II, III, and IV, as well as of King William IV and all their family members and advisors, are now in the process of being digitized. And historians have only seen a small fraction of what is in these some 350,000 items in this collection. Now, the Georgian Papers program is actually a great opportunity for all fans of history, because soon you can explore these records for yourself and you can help historians and archivists transcribe these handwritten documents as they continue to come up online. So if you enjoy exploring handwritten historical documents, you should sign up to be among the first in the Omohundro Institute's team of citizen transcribers. To become a citizen transcriber, just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash transcribe. Martin, would you tell us what happened in American mapmaking between the 1790s and 1820s and about the changes that took place in the process of making maps? There were four massive developments and John Mellish missed them all. And I keep wondering what would have happened if he had lived beyond 1821. The four changes that I tracked were the advent of lithography, which is a different form of printing. You no longer use copper plate printing. You now can have basically any piece of paper, not quite mimeograph, but it's a version thereof, an early version thereof, where images get transferred to a printing stone, hence lithography. But it all suddenly lowered the price of maps. It lowered the labor involved in reproducing a map. The other major change was the invention of machine-made paper. Actually, by the mid-1820s, machine-made paper started taking over the handmade paper because it was just so significantly cheaper and came in all kinds of qualities. Then the third major change happened in the 1840s with the advent of steam-powered presses, which map makers also very quickly adopted by the late 1840s. And then lastly, of course, the improvement, or I guess that's one way of putting it, but uh, changes in the technology of mass transportation. So first the canals and then later on the railroad. So all these four elements combined suddenly redefined the way in which a map was made, it was designed, the way it was circulated. And in many ways, actually, it also changed the look of maps significantly. You mentioned machine-made paper. And I wonder, did the paper American map makers use change the look, feel, and use of maps? Because it kind of sounds like maps made before and during the 1790s were really produced on a relatively expensive paper, while maps in the 1820s and after that date were made on cheaper machine-made paper. And I wonder, how did the change in paper change the materiality of early American maps? The earliest maps, so the handmade maps, you had this distinction between wove and blade paper. And for the paper enthusiasts, I mean, they will understand what I'm talking about. But the interesting thing there was that as a map maker, you really had to find a good balance of finding types of paper and the sizing of paper that it would allow you to, on the one hand, print large numbers, but also have the paper then still be able to hold watercolor because most maps then went through a process of hand coloring. The machine made paper, there was actually a special paper called just map paper. And that came about by the 1820s, 1830s very quickly. And That paper was sized in such a fashion that you could very easily have lithographic presses print thousands of copies, and then you still could have colorists go in and hand color the maps without having the watercolor blur too much or run off too quickly. So I think that is where the materiality of the paper comes into play. It also has to do with the fact that Americans were experimenting with map sizes. So you had these mega sized uh, 16 by 20 feet maps You had large maps, again, on average, measuring six by seven, seven by eight feet. So you needed to have fairly sturdy paper to sustain the weight of the map in and of itself. And then, of course, also to sustain the rollers and everything else that was kind of often attached as just sheer material accoutrements that go with the map. So in that sense, the paper was relevant. The moment you switch over to the logic of, well, that this is a product of lithography, What is unique about 1820s and beyond map production is that you suddenly could have 
the map sheet, the map surface become a total visual playground. Everybody was experimenting with how many pictures do I include? How many graphs do I add? How much wording? How many portraits do I want to include? So that in the end, by the 1850s, you might find maps where the actual map image is only a fraction of the whole sheet that we call the map, when in fact there was a whole lot of paratext, this is a technical term from literary studies, where you look at the text that surround the actual text, where the paratext surrounding the map is almost overwhelming, the actual map, so that as a map reader, I'm more prone to actually examine the landscape drawings or the portraits of people that are presented, that I examine the inset maps or insert maps or graphs rather than the actual map image. So again, the 1820s, 30s, 40s really kind of threw open the door to changing what does a map do as a media? What is its function? Is it really all about representing a place or a space? Or do the maps suddenly fulfill performative functions where they are actually billboards or where they are some kind of storyboard where a different story is being told by this thing called map, even though the actual map is almost the minority on this sheet? I'd like for us to explore these questions of what functions maps have and what stories do they tell a bit more, because one of the changes you noted is coming around the 1820s was a change in the technology of mass transportation, which led to a great expansion of American settlement. And really even earlier than the 1820s, I mean, just after the American Revolution, there was a lot of expansion in the United States. I mean, parts of New York and the Ohio Valley opened up to American settlement all thanks to those new boundary lines established by the Treaty of Paris 1783. And in 1803, you had the Louisiana Purchase, which nearly doubled the territory of the United States. So I wonder, what role did maps play in this era of early American westward expansion? Did maps make American expansion, or did American expansion make American maps? Or another way of rephrasing is, what comes first, the territory or the map? Does the map come before the territory? Yeah, that's a very important point and also a larger debate that is still kind of surrounding this. On the one hand, we could argue, and a lot of maps did this, and we have often even fictional accounts mocking this phenomenon where a map imagines or projects a place and people take it as real and then they arrive and discover nothing is really there. This happens in the 1830s when you have people displaced by the economic depression of the, I think, 1837. They arrive in western Michigan and discover that, lo and behold, contrary to the maps that they had in hand, there were no water mills or sawmills or there were no towns plotted out waiting for them. So on the one hand, you could say, well, maps are always propaganda tools. In this case, it was a land speculator trying to hawk land. But on the other hand, the map user is very easily lured into believing that the map is this representation of a reality. And in this case, I should say a one of many realities. So, yes, coming back to the Lewis and Clark expedition, the map that was made by Samuel Lewis in 1814, that's the most famous one that we keep referring to, probably for all intents and purposes, then opened up a perspective for map users. And I should not say users as in navigators, but people who just envisioned the continent or envisioned the world of what they think is defined as the United States of America as suddenly being available beyond the Mississippi River. And so the map in this case, yes, proceeded the actual creation of uh, sovereign states or autonomous states, let's put it this way. At the same time, and this is also fascinating to think about, the flow of information coming back from areas and territories that were still under survey or to be surveyed was really haphazard, really slow at first. And it was not until 1812 that you had the General Land Office be formed that was becoming like the clearinghouse of surveying data. And so my popular map makers, the commercial map makers, they were often always just a step behind. So on the one hand, you have maps that seem to be projecting into the future, imagining landscapes or social relations or spaces that don't exist yet. But then my commercial map makers at the same time were often just taken aback by this unbelievable onslaught of data in the 1820s and 30s, so that they basically were just updating their maps nonstop and being forced to recreate what they thought was a best-selling map and do it over within two years. And on the one hand, that, of course, fostered their business. It was really helpful for having basically a nonstop flow of new data that forces you to redo your maps. But at the same time, it often called into question the veracity of maps. It called into question their competency as as map makers. And a lot of map makers lost their livelihood because of that during this period. Wow. Why did map makers lose their livelihoods? It was partly a question of copyright infringement. There is a copyright since 1790 that actually protects maps. 
but it wasn't really enforced or enforceable. Then by the 1830s, you have the first the legal cases being brought forward to state Supreme Courts where people are actually arguing somebody stole my map. So th that was a moment when suddenly maps as commodities also became legal tender in a way that people could protect their intellectual property. And this kind of scared off, I think, a few map makers. Others then discovered that they just couldn't sustain their business given the economic pressure by sheer professional competition. So like John Malich, for example, even though he died early, at that point, by the time of his death in 1821, he was already underwater as a 1822, I should say, actually. His own business was going down because of local competition by Henry Shank Tanner, actually a guy he had subcontracted from before. And it was cutthroat business practices where people were basically underselling maps, trying to basically create special package deals where they sold maps wholesale, where they came up with all kinds of sales gimmicks. And by the 1840s, the number of original map makers that still have a brand to defend had kind of shrunk kind of significantly. So that by the 1840s, you have only like a handful of publishing houses that then identify themselves as the premier map makers. When we started our conversation about maps in colonial America, we began with wall maps. But over time, the size of maps shrank so that they fit into atlases and into pockets. Martin, would you tell us about the development of atlases and smaller sized maps? Small maps were around all along. They never were not existing parallel to wall maps. They are just, and thanks for bringing this up, because it is really important to remember that most people would have seen wall maps, large maps in public spaces only because they couldn't afford their own personal map of that size. However, most people in the, by the 1790s and 1800s at the latest would have had access to small maps the size of an octavo, like what we think of today, a postcard size map. And that would have been published in almanacs, it would have been published in school books, it would have been published in emerging magazines. It would have been published as supplements for textbooks of all sorts, travel narratives, natural histories, you name it. And these are the maps that are, by default, in and of themselves, invisible because they are tucked away. They are usually folded up. If they're fold outs, if they're a single sheet the size of a book, they would be hidden between the pages. And unless you leave through a book, you wouldn't see them. But that's kind of my big aha moment in researching this, realizing that this is what people really willfully carried with them, almost like as personal cargo, that in your almanac, in your pocket atlas, you would have this small hand-sized map with you, even though these maps would be fundamentally totally useless to find your way, other than saying I'm on the planet Earth or maybe North America. <laughs> then in terms of atlases themselves, and that's also an interesting storyline, they used to be concept books very early on. They came out by the 1700s at the very latest. In England, you had Herman Maul come out with school atlases or the early versions of what we think of as a school atlas. And they would have been large. They would have had 60 maps in it. But for the well-heeled audience, they would have probably aimed for these kind of custom-made atlases where you pick your own maps and then the bookbinder basically or the map seller would create an atlas for you. And that's where Matthew Carey, who I mentioned earlier, comes into play because in 1795, when he publishes his American atlas, we have for the first time a standardized atlas where all the sheets fit the book, where all the maps are actually following a certain logic of sequence, where they follow a certain logic of scale and design. And from then on forward, and John Mellish exploits that actually and takes it to a new level, but from then on forward, we can argue that by 1815 at the latest, you would have had the school atlas become a staple for elementary education. You would have had family atlases as a staple in middle class homes and from then on forward, basically, the atlas had arrived as like a possession that people would actually use as gift books, as a way of connecting with other family members, and also as heirlooms, where people really, in their wills, would identify the family atlas next to the family Bible as the book to be passed on. It sounds like maps played a really important role in the lives of early Americans. Maps could be heirlooms to be passed on, or they could be folded up and stuck into a pocket to bring when they were needed. Do we have any evidence about what kind of maps were so popular with early Americans and why those maps were so popular? Ah, oh, brilliant. Thanks for asking. <laughs> when I set out to do this study, I thought, well, since the discourse of nationalism and the rhetoric of nationalism was just so profound in the early decades and then it morphed very quickly also into an imperial kind of narrative, I expected that the maps would have to show North America only and I expected maps would have to be predominantly nationalistic in tenor. And 
I think I was proven partially right in my research, but what surprised me was just the range of types of maps that people owned, at least based on their probate records or wills, where it was really totally happenstance that somebody's personal interests happened to be, let's say, Poland, and there would be a Polish wall map, a wall map showing Poland recorded in the will, or that people would have had maps of the Holy Land on display in their houses right next to a map of their home state, let's say Pennsylvania right next to a map of North or South America. So there seemed to be, at least until the 1790s, when I go through the inventories, there seemed to be not much of a logic other than people had very personal, strong feelings that they used in order to define why put a certain map up on a wall. By the 1800s, I would think the archive is actually more clear cut. And yes, the national map does prevail and really dominate people's belongings. So not only just circumstantial evidence, but we know that school books were forcing, literally forcing kids to constantly memorize the nation state through a national map. But if you go into people's homes, they would have had maps of their home state and then the nation state in their dining rooms, in their hallways, even in their bedrooms. A couple of times now you've mentioned that maps were used as a way to convey and inculcate a sense of American national identity. Would you tell us more specifically how maps accomplished this function? So the way a map operated as basically the platform of a national imagining, let's put it this way, began very early, pretty much I come back to 1784, when you had three maps, Abel B. Will's map of the United States, Amos Doolittle's textbook map of the United States, and William McMurray's map of the United States. These three maps come out simultaneously the same year. And they basically show, you know, the East Coast as it's been surveyed and kind of depicted in colonial maps before, and then, of course, a whole lot of blank space between the Alleghenies, Appalachian Mountains, to the Mississippi River, to the official territorial border. And I think that was a clue that we basically used the map as a way of imagining an entity that just didn't really exist in its full form or in its experienced form yet. So in that sense, maps are really central to creating a, almost in this case, a proof of concept that you had this image of the map showing you the nation state to an audience in the 1780s, 1790s that was at best maybe interested in the nation state, some enthusiastic, but also a lot of people were detractors of the idea that there should be such a thing as the United States. By the, and this is a tandem, like a parallel development, by 1800, you also have national map lessons being basically integrated into elementary school lessons, whether it is six-year-olds or memorizing the national map in spelling bees, and then all the way forward to somebody who's boys and girls in academies and then later on in public schools who would have to actually learn and study how to draw a map from scratch. And they tended to use the national map or the home state map. So in that context, you have this fascinating moment where on the one hand, the map is showing the concept of the nation. And then it's being paired to the practice of map making that privileges the nation state. And then if you fast forward 30, 40 years, by that point, it's become second nature to imagine that the map equals the nation. And I think that's why the maps are really instrumental into the process of nation building. So when we look at a map of early America, we shouldn't just be thinking about the context it was produced in or the geographic representations it depicts, but we should also be looking at and thinking about how maps project national ambitions of what the United States as a nation could be and look like. This is very important. These maps from the earliest times, at least the colonial made maps by, let's say, Lewis Evans, and then later on the maps by Samuel Lewis, who was the principal map maker for Matthew Carey. There is a tremendous aspirational aspect built into these maps. And if you look at the map, actually, it is just stunning. Why choose this lens of just showing the mid-Atlantic states? He eclipses New England, he eclipses the South. So it was really about creating an image of something that at that point was close to people's imaginings as to what should the relationship between these different places be. In 1755, the Lewis Evans map comes on the heels of the Albany Congress, where the idea was floated that there should be an autonomous colonial entity in North America. So you could wonder if that map already also anticipated or maybe was a response to imagining, well, let's think that this map could actually depict an America independent of England or of imperial forces. If you go forward to the 1790s or 1800s, especially the large war maps by Samuel Lewis, who is completely overlooked, unfortunately, 
he decided that, yes, he can draw national maps, and he did so really well for Matthew Carey. But when he publishes his own national maps, he instantly includes the Caribbean. So there the logic was that the United States, in this case, it's circa 1815, 1814, when this map comes out, that the United States' sphere of influence was definitely larger than the official territorial outline, and that the Caribbean basin, at least, would be part of this sphere of influence. And then you can kind of begin to start thinking, to what extent does, for example, the Monroe Doctrine reflect these earlier maps? Is that perhaps informed by maps like Lewis's already kind of territorially isolating, separating America from Europe on the one hand, but also then separating the nation state or integrating the nation state to larger geographical units? So yes, these maps always in their design fulfill more than just the function of, I will show you the topography, the lay of the land. I will show you a particular place in maybe accurate or inaccurate ways. Automatically, there's a different narrative built into the map. And that is informed. And that's, again, why the social life of maps is so important. It totally depends on the people who helped influence the design of the map. And then later on, the people who actually put these maps to use. Maybe Lewis had no intention of making the Caribbean part of his thinking, but it might have just then been adapted by successive generations as thinking, yes, the sphere of influence of the United States should be greater than North America. It should include Central America or South America. Our conversation has seemed like a whirlwind overview of all the wonderful detailed information that Martin included in his book, The Social Life of Maps in America. Martin, given your extensive research into early American maps, Why do you think it's important for us to consider and better understand early American maps and the early American map making business? How do you think taking the time to look at maps and how they were made will help us better understand the history of early America? I just come back to the what to many people might be just the humdrum kind of business of historians. But think about the map business in and of itself, not the maps, just the business is really revelatory. When you think that early maps were not so much about mimetic representation, creating an accurate image, but they were always about visualizing your community and visualizing yourself in relationship to your community. And I think that's why studying these maps is really important. If you were thinking in terms of defining an 18th century map, let's say the Jefferson Fry map of Virginia, if you think of that map as a representation of a real place, you'll be sorely disappointed because it's very inaccurate. A lot of things are just out of place. They're not accounted for. But my audience at that point knows that. And they are willing to make the allowances of being forgiving about mistakes on the map on the one hand, but at the same time being very eager of hanging up this map as a wall map in their dining room, in their parlors, and making them as part of their everyday life visual landscape. And I think that's why engaging with these early maps is really important for us because it helps us understand how Americans were positioning themselves, shaping their attitude towards place, towards space, towards land, towards the way in which we conceive land as property or as political territory, and how they think of themselves vis-a-vis their nation. If they wanted it to be a nation at first, you can think of it as a question of how do these maps really shape our experiential habits, right? To what extent are we using maps as crutches or as prosthetic devices that allow me from childhood on forward to constantly feel in place, that I know where I'm at because I have access to coordinates, because I have access to the geographic grid. And now it's time for the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, how would American history have been different if maps had been too expensive to become objects in early Americans' everyday lives? That would have been a radical departure of how we even think of ourselves as a people, I would argue. Just think, if you didn't have maps available already during the negotiations of the Treaty of Paris in 1783. And these would have been already kind of mass-produced maps in their own right. If you didn't have maps in classrooms shaping students' attitude towards space as being a geometrical, quantifiable entity, we would have a completely different way of seeing the world. We would have a completely different way probably of organizing America. 
without maps. So if maps only had remained as expensive luxury artifacts, articles that people would have had as collectible items that they might only find perhaps in state houses and that you only might find in corporate headquarters today. If every man and every woman wouldn't have access to the map, we would have not this perception or perspective of remote sensing. We would not have the sense that we could do reconnaissance from a distance. We would have no access to this thing called the God's eye view or the bird's eye view, where you can just have this detached total overview that allows you to do comparative analyses of places across the globe. We would not have access to the way in which we think about the concept of what is a boundary, what constitutes a boundary, it might have changed our outlook on how we define property. It might have changed our outlook on how we define neighborly relationships. Because without a map, we do not have this filter or this go-between object that allows you to basically just create in different scalar models, create relationships between people. Martin, you've written two books on maps. Do you have a third in the works? My third book probably will take me into a different direction. And this is inspired by this last book, actually, the focus on the material culture of maps. But in this case, I would study the way in which everyday objects and also particularly commodified objects entered into our way of thinking about literature. So I'm looking at object narratives and how that coincides with, of course, the take of the modern marketplace and capitalism in early America. Our conversation has been a far ranging one. How can we contact you if we have more questions about maps in early America? At the moment, the best place of getting in contact with me would be actually through personal email. My email address is mcb at udel.edu. You can also go to my department's homepage or just actually if you Google me, I think I'll come up within the second or third entry and you find my personal page as it is posted on our department's home site. Martin Bruckner, thank you for helping us explore the social life of maps in early America. Thank you so much for having me. Early Americans were interested in maps for many reasons. To start with, maps provided information about space, place, topography, and geography. Maps allowed early Americans to get places and to visualize their place within a larger world. They also allowed Americans to prepare for and wage war. During the American Revolution and the War of 1812, American and British soldiers alike used maps with lots of geographic data to help plan their battle tactics and strategies while their family members at home referenced smaller maps to help locate the points where their loved ones had served in battle. And after the war, maps provided early Americans with aspirations and ideas about their future. During the 1780s and 1790s, many Americans gazed upon maps of their new nation and wondered whether the United States would last and stand the test of time. And if it did stand the test of time, should their new nation be one that grew to expand across a continent? Maps served as usable practical objects, as artwork, as educational devices in schools, and as public documents. Maps were really important. So it's no wonder then that early Americans sought to make their own maps long before they contemplated their independence from Great Britain. The earliest American-made maps appeared in books like William Wood's 1634 book, The New England Prospect. In 1755, Lewis Evans published the first large map comprised of data that he took personally and borrowed from other map makers. Publishing this map was no small feat for Evans. He not only had to travel to survey British North America, he also had to find comparable maps and travel reports to fill in data that he needed. He had to synthesize all the coordinates and locations he had onto a paper draft, and then he had to find a printer with engraving skills and a big enough roller press to print his 22 by 30 inch map. Now, 40 and 50 years later, men like Matthew Carey and John Malish revolutionized the American map-making business by treating maps as a serious publication. Their business models combined with an increased demand for maps, technological developments in printing, and cheaper machine-made paper made maps cheaper and more widely available in America by the 1820s and 1830s. It's clear from Martin's research that Americans enjoyed national maps. They appear over and over in probate records, wills, and estate inventories. Still, his research also reveals that, like us, early Americans enjoyed maps for a whole host of reasons. Reasons that made maps social objects and gave them social lives. You can find more information about Martin, his book, The Social Life of Maps in America, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com. Slash one seven seven.
If this episode piqued your curiosity as to what the maps by Henry Popple, Joshua Fry, and Peter Jefferson, and Lewis Evans look like, you should check them out in the OI Reader app. The Omohundro Institute and the University of North Carolina Press have made images of these maps available to us, as well as two chapters from Martin's book, The Social Life of Maps in America. To download the free OI Reader app to your favorite iOS or Android device, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash OI Reader or search for OI Reader in your favorite app store. Finally, do you have maps on display in your home or office? Or have you used a map recently? Send me a picture, liz at benfranklinsworld.com, because I'd love to see the maps you enjoy looking at and the maps you use. And if you show me your maps, I'll show you mine, because I have a bunch of maps that I love. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.